Hi, Life Group leaders. Today we're going to be previewing Lesson 8, Genesis chapter 9, and our lesson text says 1 through 15. My suggestion to you is to go 1 through 17 because it kind of completes the thought. Now, the title they gave to us is the word protect, and, and it's a good, it's a good title. But I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to come up with my, with my own, and I'm going to entitle my lesson, New Beginnings. And the reason I'm going to do that is, even though all of us can say that we came from, from Adam, and the Bible tells us that, uh, we can also say we all came from Noah, and from his three sons, all the tribes of the earth has come to be. And we know that when God caused the flood, he protected, Noah found favor, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and so there was this new beginning. And even though it's not part of our lesson, I, I think I'm going to touch on that because now that I'm, well, almost 73, I look back over my life and I realize there's been times in my life God's allowed me to kind of start over, especially around the age of 30 is when he really got hold of me spiritually. And I've always been appreciative of God's patience in my life. And I think you, what you might could do if you choose to do so is briefly touch on that because there may be someone in your class that's struggling through some of the issues of life and they almost want to either throw up their hands and quit or perhaps start over. And I think uh, there's a theme there that you could use. Now, there's a couple lead-ins to the lessons that you may want to consider. Uh, first of all, I, I think it would be good for you to touch on Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. We're videoing this two weeks out and uh, Ken Gaines will be teaching this coming Sunday. And so I'm not sure how he's going to handle Genesis chapter 8. Uh, and so uh, for me, I, I may do some adjusting on that. But the reason I think chapter 8, is, at the end of chapter 8, is, is important is because the Bible tells us the first thing Noah did, he built an altar and he worshipped. And what's interesting is that God accepted his worship and then right after that, God acknowledges man's sin nature. In fact, it says the intent of his heart is evil from his youth. And so even though Noah uh, made an altar in worship and God accepted it, God acknowledges that Noah still had an evil heart, as a, a sin nature. And from that statement, of course, we see the rest of the Bible. We see the rest of human history up to uh, today, even in our own lives. And so you may want to you may want to think about that or chew on that a little bit. Uh, another thing you may want to think about, and and Ken will probably do this, knowing the way Ken Ken's a good teacher and the way he teaches. But you may want to touch on the fact that after the flood, there were profound changes in the world geographically. Uh, the landscape change. You could point to the Grand Canyon. You may want to pick out some other illustrations. Geographically, the world was just different. Geologically, the world was different. We find fossil fuels, coal, and petroleum. And even though that's a result of God's judgment, the flood, actually, that's God gave us that for protection. I, I wish Biden would understand that maybe coal and maybe petroleum is God's provision for us and that's part of his grace after judgment there's grace even in judgment there's always grace uh, also in chapter 8 it mentions the seasoning seasons I think in a nutshell we could say the the harmony was gone the seasons come man's got to uh, work for everything and so everything is different now and the effects of the sun and all of those things come into play and I think that's going to play out a little bit uh, in, in our lesson today. Let me tell you how I'm going to teach the lesson. I'm going to have three points. I'm kind of pointed when I preach or teach, and I always kind of line up with the same, either P, T's, or C's. Uh, well, this lesson is going to be P's. And in chapter 9, verse 1, I'm just going to touch for a moment on that word populate because we see similarities here. And in Genesis chapter 1, where God says to, to multiply, replenish, to Noah, replenish the earth. And what's interesting, that word multiply is built off a form of the word for locusts. 
And if you remember, there are several places in the Old Testament where swarms of locusts was coming. And, of course, the idea there is that God wanted Noah and his family to multiply, to, to, to fill the earth. In fact, God will tell Noah twice to do that. However, there's something else I believe embedded, embedded here, and, and especially in Genesis 1 and 2, and that is the idea of stewardship. Now, in Genesis 9, God does not say subdue and rule, uh, but he does imply that each of us have responsibilities to his creation. There's a stewardship idea here. He, of course, he'll talk about the animals now fearing man and not being in harmony with man. There's a, I'll touch on that in ju just a moment. But I think what I'm going to emphasize right here at this point is not just the multiplication, but the fact is that, that we should have stewardship responsibility to all of God's gifts to us, and especially that applies to his creation. Now, my second point is going to be in verses 2 through 7, and I'm going to use the word protection. And there's, in fact, this is the institution of civil government. It begins kind of here. And there's two areas that God deals with. First of all, God deals with man's diet. We're going to talk just in a minute about that but also in man's discipline. Now, with regard to diet, God now allows man to eat protein, meat. Praise the Lord, we get to eat steak. Now, why? Well, perhaps because of the effects of the flood. Man needs more protein. Uh, but meat has more protein in it than vegetables. Of course, if you're a vegetarian, you're probably not going to like that statement. But uh, the fact is, I think maybe God allows us to eat meat because of some of the effects of the flood, and we need more protein protein. It's kind of interesting. Some have suggested the re one of the reasons perhaps he allows man to eat meat is that man now becomes a hunter. Animals tend to reproduce much quicker and they might would overpower man. And so now man becomes the hunter to keep the uh, dominion, if you would say, over the animals. That's a good thought. You might touch on that. It might provide some good discussion for you. Uh, and so uh, first of all, he deals with man diet. But then also we see protection in that murder is prohibited. Capital punishment is instituted. And, and I want you to listen to me for just a moment. I want to throw out a caution to you. Teachers, you're going to have to deal with this issue. Now, it could be that you're opposed to capital punishment. And frankly, if you are, you're going to be in trouble here because the Bible institutes it. And how you deal with it, I don't know. In all probability, you might have some class members that are opposed to it. And if you do, uh, good luck with that. Uh, but again, we always must go back to Scripture on every issue, uh, every challenging issue in culture. Uh, we can't operate by our feelings, our desires, or what we think. We have to go back to Scripture. And Scripture institutes capital punishment. Now, some of the arguments might be, well, that's the Old Testament and that's the law. Well, and now we're in times of the New Testament grace. Well, Genesis 9 is pre-law. It's part of the civil government that he's instituting. And in fact, even in the law, the Ten Commandments prohibits murder. By the way, you could also throw in Romans 13, 4 as some additional argument there. And so what Here's what I wrote, and here's what you might want to chew on. The punishment must fit the crime. God did not give this divine punishment for reformatory purposes, but for punitive purposes. You see, murder violates the image of God in man. And God's verdict is that the guilty must be punished. And again, I emphasize to you, we cannot argue against God's word. When I was studying out uh, this text for this lesson, I came across something that one of the theologians said. He wrote, No sin shows a greater contempt for life than homicide. And teachers, I, I, I agree with that. In fact, I will add to it. Uh, this is where I think I'm going to make the point that abortion is murder. Yes, there's grace for those who 
have, have had a, abortions. We don't want to miss the grace element in anything. But you think about it. More babies have been killed through abortion than all of the world world's wars combined. Sometimes I wonder what God thinks about his little children being murdered. And if you want to camp out on this idea of abortion being murder, uh, then one of the arguments is that a baby in the womb is not a body part. If it's a body part, women ought to have control over it. But if a baby in the womb is a fact, a baby, a person, then God has control over that. And, and so I think abortion fits this, this rule here, and that may be a little extreme for some, uh, but again, I just think you're going to have to deal with it. So in my second point here, we see God's protection over man in his diet and in his discipline. And then the last section, I just wrote down promise, and that's going to be verses 8 through, not just 15, but 8 through 17. And let me mention a couple things here. A covenant, he talks about establishing the covenant. And a covenant can either be bilateral or unilateral. Now, bilateral is between two partners. We see that in Scripture. God institutes covenants that are bilateral in nature. God says, if you do this, I'll do that. I'm going to do this, you should do that. And amazing, God always holds true to his even when we break ours. That's a bilateral covenant. Here in Genesis chapter 9, it's a unilateral covenant. It's made by God alone. And of course, God never breaks his covenant. He's sovereign, isn't he? His covenant is unconditional. And the rainbow in the sky reminds us of this promise. Don't you know when it rained or stormed, Noah and his family felt God's comfort because of the covenant that had been established? In fact, if I counted right in verses 9 through 17, we were talking about God's covenant and the establishment of God's covenant. We see God's personal pronoun used, I think it, I counted right, 13 times. God's promises always prevail. And I believe you can share that with your students, and hopefully that will give them some encouragement. And then there's one last thing that I'm going to mention, and you may want to mention it as well. In the events of the flood, what we see is often described as God's common grace. Let me explain that. Common grace is God's blessings upon all people, and all people should have enough sense to know that there is a God worth seeking after. God's creation shows us that. The bow in the sky points to God. And so creation before the flood and after the flood cries out, there is a God that man should seek, and if man seeks God and finds God, man will have life and eternal life. But listen to me. Common grace does not save man. Common grace has no redemptive attributes. Common grace... God's creation is sufficient to condemn man and it removes any excuses when man stands before God and says, I didn't know anything about you. And God's going to say, yes, you did. Look at my creation. Look at the mountains and the valleys. Look at my world after the flood. Those were evidences that I exist and you should seek me. Therefore, you have no excuses. And so as I end my lesson, teachers, I'm going to share the responsibility that Christians have to point all men to our God. He blesses his creation. He redeems the lost. And all of creation cries out before the world that there is a God that man should seek and there are no excuses. Well, that's kind of in summary, a uh, quick summary. I may change it a little bit over the next week, but that's kind of where I'm headed with this lesson. There may some, be some things in there you can use. There may not be. But in any event, uh, while I started uh, studying, I wasn't thrilled about the text I was assigned. Uh, 
Uh, the fact of the matter is, I'm glad I was assigned it because I learned some things, and I believe you'll learn some things, and you can share with your students some things. Isn't it? Isn't it a blessing to take God's word, study God's word, try to break some things out, learn from it, and share what we've learned? Well, God bless you. Our pastor wants you to know he appreciates what you do in your small groups. Very, very critical to the health of Indian Springs Baptist Church. You do a, you do a good job. Don't stop. See you Sunday.